Before I get into the message of the morning, I want you to think just for a moment on that last song. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. You realize someday that song will not be sung anymore. Because the time of salvation, forgiveness of sins, will end with the end of this whole world. That we have now to take advantage of the gospel of Christ. Because when that hand of salvation from God is withdrawn, there's simply nothing but a fearful looking to of righteous indignation for those who did not take advantage of the mercy and grace of God in the gospel. Keeping with what we have been doing, I want us to note another significant identifying mark found in the New Testament of the church that Jesus built. If I stand before you today and say miracles happen today or miracles do not happen today it must be one or the other now I must define the word miracle because it means all sorts of things to all kinds of people throughout the world when I speak of a miracle I mean one like Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead are Jesus walking on the water, setting aside natural law that he himself created and sustains by the word of his power to do such things as I just mentioned. I'm not talking about wonder drugs that freed us from a lot of the various illnesses that plagued mankind for years and some Scientists discovered it. Those are wonderful things, and sometimes we call them miracle drugs. So I'm not speaking of those things. I'm not speaking of when there's a terrible automobile accident and it just seems impossible that anybody could come out of it. And yet someone does, and they come out of it unscathed. And we say, that was miraculous. That's not the biblical usage of the word miracle. I've just explained that to you. Now do miracles like Jesus did and the apostles did that you read of in your own New Testament, do they still exist today? There are a lot of people, a lot of folks who believe in Christ who say that they do. Well, on what proof do they go on to determine that? I would remind every one of us regarding our soul's needs. There's no greater need than that. That we're admonished to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 And if I were to affirm to you that miracles like Jesus and the apostles worked, as I have defined them today, then I must have biblical proof. Somebody says, well... I saw it. You saw what? You saw somebody raise from the dead? Why stop at that one? If somebody loved their loved one that much that you would use that kind of power to raise the dead, are you going to play respect of persons and not raise other people's loved ones from the dead? It's like the old saying goes, the fellow says, well, I can raise people from the dead. All right, let's go to the cemetery. You tell them to get up, and I'll tell them to stay down, and we'll see which one has the power. Now, that may sound light and frivolous, but when people make such claims, as I've just mentioned, they need to be tested. The church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation was commended by Jesus Christ for putting to the test those that claimed to be apostles and found they weren't but found that they were liars. And he says, that was a good thing you did in doing that. He blessed them for it. Because they were practicing 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 
Let's look for a moment at the miracles that our Lord worked. God has never asked us to accept something as from Him without adequate evidence, proper, complete truth, credible witnesses. Some people's definition of faith is, well, where knowledge ends, then you hope for that, which really means wish for that, and that's faith. That's not the Bible definition of faith. The Bible definition of faith, confidence, beliefs, trust in God and godly things is one built upon evidence. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by the word of God because the word of God reveals the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of God, the savior of the world. That he is who he claimed to be when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. So one of the great ways that Jesus proved that he was the word made flesh that John wrote about in John 1, 14, that he was the son of God, was that he worked miracles. You'll remember that Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, readily admitted as much when he said, we know, notice no ifs, ands, or buts about it, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these things that thou doest, except God be with him. John 3, 2. Now, he didn't understand a lot of other things about Christ because he had the false Jewish notion of a Messiah and the nature of the kingdom and the design and purpose of the Jews as a physical nation and the law of Moses. But he understood nobody's going to be able to work miracles, remember how we defined it, except God be with him. That was God's stamp of saying, this man is doing my will. In fact, Jesus' claim demanded miracles and he established that claim as John wrote toward the end of his account of the gospel in John 20 in verse 30 by doing many other signs which are not written in this book now we'll look at the latter part of that in a moment but that tells me something about a miracle John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's the very one who enabled the apostles to work miracles. Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. So he could work miracles, and they were signs to people. Well, a sign is not a sign of itself. As I've said countless times, if you're needing gasoline, you don't pull up to the sign and expect to get gasoline out of a sign. The sign points you to the source of the gasoline. And the miracles that Jesus worked said, God is with this man. Just to list a few, and that's all I will do. The blind received their sight, John 9, 1 through 12. The lame were made to walk, Matthew 21, verse 14. The lepers were cleansed, Luke 17, 11 through 19. The deaf were made to hear, Mark 7, 31 through 37. The sick were healed, Matthew 8, 14 through 17. Devils or demons were cast out, Matthew 8, 28 through 34. I said earlier that Jesus walked on the water, Matthew 14, 22 through 33. The wind and the sea obeyed him, Matthew 8, 27. Imagine a hurricane like we've experienced around here, and a man just stands up very calmly, says, Peace, be still. And immediately, it's all gone. Thousands were fed with only a few loaves and fishes, Matthew 14, 13. Through 21. And of course, as I've mentioned, he raised the dead, John 11, 32 through 45. And he went beyond all this and made the evidence impregnable forever 
in that he yielded himself to die on the cross and then was raised from the dead, John 20, 19 through 31. As Peter pointed out, or as Luke records, that he showed himself alive after his passion by many proofs, Acts 1 and verse 3. Why are those in your Bible? What are we to get from them when we read them? You say, but now wait. You're reading these things that people wrote about him that he did almost 2,000 long years ago. Well, let's try something here. As far as I know, time does not change proof. Time does not change evidence. Time does not change the truth. Let's suppose for a moment that Jesus was alive in our day, looking just like the ordinary one of us. But doing all those things we read that he did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's suppose that he was here just a little beyond three years. And I have no doubt that he would have died the same way and for the same reason because that's the way the world treats someone who did as Jesus did. And he died for the same reason. It just is happening our time, not back then. Thus he rises from the dead, as you read of him doing so in the four accounts of the gospel. But yet we saw him. Some of us were healed by him. We heard him. Some of us were his disciples and followed closely with him. We could see the look on his face. We could hear the sound of his voice. We could recall the way he looked walking, the way he operated, the way he stood, certain gestures. All of that is we do that with one another. Well, he ascends back to heaven. He's no longer on this earth as Jesus did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John recorded. Then we are endowed, certain ones of us who were called by Christ to do just what the apostles did with the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit so we could remember infallibly every word that he ever taught and that he could guide us further. And so we went out and began to preach the gospel. And we declared just like the apostles did on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, our sermons were like that one that Luke recorded that Jesus did. And we wouldn't change it any other way because I don't know how you would change it and preach it any other way than what Peter did. And what would you preach? You can't do any more than preach what they preached. And they certainly couldn't find his body because it wouldn't be there any more than they could find it in those days. But then in time, the apostles are dead, and the people who knew him in the flesh are all dead. And people continue to preach because they heard these men, the apostles and others who knew Jesus. But there's a time when all those people who knew Christ and even the next generation saw a couple hundred years pass by. Has the truth changed? All right, in our future, same thing happens. All of us who experienced him in the flesh, we're all gone. Our children are gone. Our grandchildren are gone. Our great-grandchildren are gone. Would the message change? Would the proof change? Would the passing of time change? So when somebody tells me that what is said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not to be accepted because it's about 2,000 years old. The burden of proof is on you to tell me why. Even as it would be in the scenario I set up just a moment ago. And if 2,000 years from now, when all that I said happened in our day, someone were to say, well, if I could just see him again, I'd believe. You see what that means. You can't believe in him through adequate evidence. 
credible witnesses. You have to behold him with your own eyes as did some of that day and time. The problem with that is, is that many who did behold him do these things did not believe on him. Some of the priests believed on him, but for fear of being put out of the synagogues, they wouldn't confess him to be who they knew he was. So simply knowing him in the sense we know one another in the flesh doesn't guarantee you're going to accept him. Thus, it has to be on the matter of what is the credible evidence. One of those things are the miracles that he did. And when I read you that list of miracles that are recorded, I believe them with all of my heart because I have no reason to reject them. I find no reason, underscore reason, to reject them. They're just as true as that they happened yesterday. Because time and the passing of time has no bearing on truth. And thus you have John 8, 31 and 32, and that uh, if you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, can we continue in his word? Can we still know the gospel? Can we still believe it, having understood it? Can we, can we uh, comply with its terms of pardon? Yes, we can know what we're doing. The warranted signs of Christ were recorded then for producing faith, belief, confidence, trust, in Christ, in his gospel system. Remember, the gospel is his power to save, Romans 1, 16. Now we're back to what I said we'd go a moment ago of John 20, 30, and 31, where John was concluding his book by saying, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Well, then why are these written? He says, But these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. So we see the purpose of recording some of these signs. To produce faith in Christ. And furthermore, we see why many other signs were not written. They weren't needed to accomplish the purpose. Everything in this book serves its purpose. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says all scriptures give a man inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Well then, the miracles recorded are sufficient for what they were recorded for. Or to say it more properly, for which they were recorded <laughs> So all of this being true, then there's no need today for any manifestation of supernatural power in the form of a miracle to convince anyone that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is any more than who he's declared to be, the Son of the living God, the only Savior of the world. But then there is the matter of the message from heaven. And in quoting 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says all scripture is given by inspiration, theophanustos, a compound Greek word meaning breathed out of God. It says it comes from the depths of deity. The mind of God relative to man's salvation is given. Well, it was indispensable that the first preachers of the gospel, as I said a moment ago, be inspired of the Holy Spirit, be directly guided by God to infallibly record the will of God. To know what they say. They therefore were given the ability as the apostles of Christ. And those the apostles laid hands on to work certain miracles. How are you going to believe Philip in Samaria when he preaches the gospel if he cannot prove that the message he speaks is from heaven and not from men? Yet they saw those miracles and they believed the message. I think that's interesting. Today people get it backwards. They see the miracles and they're amazed at the miracles. Those people at that time heard the miracles were amazed at the message. That's the way it was designed to be. The miracles confirmed the word. Confirmed it in what way? That it's from God and not from men. In keeping with the needs characteristic of the beginning of the gospel, 
then the apostles themselves, the apostles of Christ, were promised the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit that they could be the ambassadors of the court of heaven. An ambassador speaks for the king or for the government. How could they do that without infallible guidance? They're mere men. So they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is recorded in Acts chapter 2. You see the promise made to them in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. I want you to consider these thoughts relating to that particular promise to the apostles. First of all, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, would speak through the apostles. The promise that was made by Jesus to the apostles concerning their guidance once he went back to heaven is seen in Mark 13, 11. That is, they would not be speaking of their own power and volition and learning. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit. That ties right back into all scriptures given by inspiration of God. So it would be the Holy Spirit himself who would bring to memory everything Jesus taught and guide them into all truth. In John 14, 26, the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, shall teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I have said unto you. John 14, 26. Where is the person today that claims the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit like the apostles received? Who can do that? If you were debating any one of them today, I promise you they would have notes laid out before them. And they would have their Bible there. Folks, the apostles didn't have to do that. They could write one. And they did. The Holy Spirit was to bear witness of Christ. John 15, 26, Jesus said to them that he would bear witness of me. The Holy Spirit was to guide them into not some, not most, but all truth. John 16, 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all the truth. That means there's no latter-day revelation, folks. There's no dreams coming today. There's no whispers coming from some thicket out in the woods make the hair crawl up back your neck and you say that was an angel speaking to me there's nothing like that happening if you think you're hearing things like that get an appointment with doctors that are capable of handling that or quit drinking or smoking whatever it is it's causing it to happen God communicates with you today through God's word and you won't know a thing he said if you don't study it that's why Hosea said of Israel of old, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's why we're commanded to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a work when they needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. The Holy Spirit would clothe the apostles with power. Jesus said, ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send you forth the promise of my Father. But tarry ye in the city, that city of Jerusalem, until you be endued, or as American standards say, clothed with power from on high. Luke 24, 48 and 49. Now that power from the Holy Spirit would enable them to do superhuman things. Things beyond the normal powers of a normal human being. The Holy Spirit would guide them. Thus when I read my Bible and I say Paul said this, in reality God wrote the Bible Regardless of the fleshly hand that wrote it down, God wrote the Bible. We must understand, as is said in Mark 16, 17, and 18, concerning the apostles, and these signs shall accompany or follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall in no wise hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Why don't you people in the church of Christ who bear down so heavily on Mark 16, 15, and 16, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, preach those other two verses, verses 17 and 18. Well, it's very simple. 
those other two verses had to do with the first century and the revelation of God's will and the confirmation of the same. But the gospel abides forever as far as this world is concerned. It's been confirmed. There's no new revelation. If you want to know of a miracle, I'll read you one. But I promise you this day, I'll never see one done by anybody today living or anybody in the future. And nobody in the past but the apostles and those they laid hands on who had the miraculous gifts, all nine mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The apostles had all those plus one. They could lay hands on somebody and impart a miraculous gift. All that was essential because they had no completed written down New Testament. Well, how are they going to know how to live the Christian life? They wouldn't except that God guided them in that infant stage of the church, and that's why we call it infant stage of the church, until the truth could come. So for what purpose were these signs to accompany the word? Well, listen. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. That's in verse 20. Now, if you're going to fuss about Mark 16, 15, and 16, and say you ought to preach, if you're going to preach those two verses, preach the next two, then I'm going to tell you also to preach chapter, verse 20 of chapter 16. And there's nobody that can do that today. We've seen people attempt it, but they can't do it. Listen to what the Hebrews writer had to say along this line. He's re reiterating actually the purpose of miracles which having at the first began to be spoken through the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing witness with them, both by signs and wonders, and by manifold powers, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. Now that's the design and the purpose of miracles concerning Christ, and concerning the work of the apostles. Sometimes people say, well, you're, you challenge me to heal this sick person. Well, I can't do it unless you really believe I can. I got as much faith as Lazarus did in the tomb. And he had none. He was dead. I didn't stop Jesus from raising from the dead. And so it is, we must understand, they are signs they proved Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, and they proved the apostles were speaking the will of God. So it was necessary that the Holy Spirit come upon the apostles, that the gospel might be proclaimed with infallible, unerring certainty. The revelation of the message of salvation could not be trusted to the, infall to the fallible memories of fallible men. So there had to be some way they could be made infallible. Well, it couldn't come from any other man. So it came from God. Next, it was essential that signs accompany them to the end that that message be authenticated. I'm going to pause here. We'll continue, the Lord willing, this afternoon, our 1.30 service. But we need to understand there are certain people even in the church that I've run across over the years who know so little about the Bible they will declare well I, I just know that had to be a miracle well remember if any man speak let him speak as the oracles of God let's call a miracle a miracle as the Bible called it a miracle and define it by the Bible let's understand the design and the purpose of miracles. And we'll look some then at the duration of miracles, and especially this afternoon, the Lord willing, as it bore upon the transmission of truth from heaven to men. That's why that we need to study the scriptures. And we don't need to be letting up on reminding ourselves of the importance of studying the scriptures. We may get tired of hearing 2 Timothy 2.15, or such as the passage printed above my head, Colossians 3.17. But why would a child of the living God ever get tired of hearing that? Because it's the only way you're going to understand God's will for your life. is to study the Bible. 
learn how to study it and to apply it to your life. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to become just that. We're not inviting you to become some sort of hyphenated Christian, but a Christian like you read of in your New Testament as is defined and used therein. To believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30, confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10, to complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized by the authority of Christ into Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. If as a child of God you've wandered from the way, the straight and narrow way to heaven, by sinning, we urge you to humble yourself and repent of those sins and God's great second law of pardon. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject, therefore, to the gospel of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.